Hello, we're live. Okay, there we go. Laura will wave at me if uh, we don't have what we need. Um, we're going to show a slide sideways. So uh, get, get ready, turn your head sideways, uh, get ready to look at something uh, slightly funny. Uh, apologies to everyone for starting a couple minutes late. We'll give people a chance to arrive and say hello during that time to people who are uh, watching this on a recording. Uh, if you're wondering where you are or why you're here, uh, you're at my live stream. I'm Squirrel. This is the Squirrel Squadron. And here on the Squirrel Squadron, we uh, like to get together with uh, tech and non-tech executives, and we talk about things that can help uh, technology teams be more profitable. So uh, I'm going to check with Laura that we've uh, got everything as we should. She'll give me a, a wave if we're all right. Laura, are we coming through okay? She says yes. Okay, good news. All right. So uh, I'm going to assume that uh, everything is working as it should. Uh, if for any reason yeah, you need to leave, that's okay. Don't worry, because uh, this will always be available as a recording. Uh, the best place to find it, of course, is the Squirrel Squadron uh, Forum. And on there, you can discuss all kinds of interesting topics. Uh, we were discussing um, how to handle remote teams and how to... Uh, build a career ladder, uh, all kinds of uh, uh, interesting and important topics. Uh, and I'm always there uh, responding and commenting. So, um, uh, and you can get these recordings. Uh, so that's the easiest place. It'll also be here on uh, YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever you're watching me. Uh, what's our topic today? Well, it's risk. And um, uh, it, risk gets such a bad rap that uh, I'm going to try to convince you that your tech team should be using risk, should be taking risk, should be doing more risky things. And uh, that's something that scares a lot of people. So if you're feeling nervous or frightened, um, you know, make sure you're centered on your chair, get comfortable, do some breathing exercises, because uh, I'm going to help you to see uh, how risk could really change your point of view. Uh, and one of the things I'm going to make you do is turn your head sideways, because I have not been able to get this uh, blankety blank slide to show uh, the correct way around. So I'm going to show it sideways. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, anything else I wanted to mention? Well, we have a number of other events coming up soon. So uh, if you're interested in this and more uh, discussions of this kind, we have a live one coming up 7th of July. That's on detecting and handling tech baloney. So uh, when are you getting a line of uh, bull and uh, what should you do about it? Uh, well, that could be from a vendor, from your own tech team telling you, yeah, it'll be done on Thursday and you're tired of hearing it. Uh, I'll uh, help you deal with uh, what, what happens when you're being fed a line, when you're, you're getting something that doesn't make sense. Um, we've got some wonderful guests coming. Um, ben uh, Summers is going to talk about his amazing engineering culture that he built at his uh, company, uh, how to keep your team extremely motivated and make sure they go home on time uh, and are still super productive. Uh, we're going to talk about career ladders, and uh, then one of my favorites, uh, uh, that's coming, Career Ladders is coming up 14th of July with some great folks from a company called Progression. Um, and 30th of June, I'm jumping around here because these are so interesting, um, is uh, all about tough choices. So um, uh, we're all having to make some very tough choices in tech these days. Um, I've got uh, clients who are deciding uh, whether they should cut 10% or 20% of their staff, um, whether they should launch the new product. Um, these are the sorts of things that um, uh, I want to help you think about, think through. So uh, I'll be uh, leading a discussion on that topic. How do you make those tough choices? How do you uh, decide among different things you might try? Okay, so uh, let's get started. And I'm very sorry. I thought this would be very easy to show, but uh, for whatever reason, uh, uh, Chrome or StreamYard or both are just insisting on showing my slide sideways. So really sorry, but um, I think all of you are capable of turning your head the correct direction. I think that's the direction on your screen, although it now makes it upside down for me. Uh, this is the tilted slider. And um, it's usually not this tilted. <laughs> usually it's tilted so that it's uh, sloping from upper right to lower left. And it starts with productivity in the upper right and predictability in the lower left. And it's a slider, like the um, slider that you might have seen on a radio um, or on, uh, uh, usually they're, they're not physical anymore. I was a helicopter going over my house, so uh, we get all, all sorts going on. But um, uh, the slider allows you to move up and down where you want to be set, where your team should be looking. Um, should it be looking to be as productive as possible, to be trying things, to be out there um, uh, experimenting and iterating and doing more? Um, and uh, if things go wrong, well, that's okay. We're going to deal with them. That would be the productivity angle. Usually a startup, a very small startup that's, uh, you know, think of Apple in the garage. Uh, they're the ones who are there on the productivity scale. Um, and then uh, completely at the other end is NASA. Right, so uh, I looked it up uh, for the book I wrote um, uh, with my colleague Jeffrey. Um, uh, figured out that uh, NASA produces, uh, I think it was something like a hundred lines of code each year for each developer. 
So um, you can imagine the very slow, very cautious, very thoughtful productivity, productivity focused uh, activity that NASA engages in. And, and you can see why they would, because if they miss the predicted date, if they don't have the rocket on the launch pad with the right software on the right date, guess what? The rocket isn't going to launch and they'll miss Mars and, and Mars isn't going to wait. So there's a really, really good reason why they need to be down at the productivity end of the scale. I hope you all still have your, your heads turned so you're seeing this the right way around. Because I'm about to get to why it's the tilted slider. Now, as I say, it's not usually this far tilted. It's usually it's just tilted this far, you know, so it's, it's tilted something like this. And you can move the slider up and down. And there's something that pulls it downward. There's something that pulls it toward predictability. And that is the desire for control. Or uh, if we look at our title today, uh, uh, it's the desire to have less risk. So my question to you out there, um, and I want you to comment in the chat, if we don't have a chat discussion going on here, we're, we're, we're not. this is going to be a short discussion. That's fine with me. I'll go walk the dog. But um, uh, if you want to get questions answered, if you want to think through these issues, if you're struggling with uh, a, a risk-averse culture uh, that is um, uh, being too productive too far down on the uh, predictability end of the slider, then uh, tell me about that. What brought you here? What made you interested in reducing risk or increasing risk, uh, dealing with risk better? Uh, what made this topic interesting enough to you that made you want to come? And what questions do you have? Uh, so I'm going to do my very best to deal with any questions that you throw in. There may or may not be lots of them. We'll see. Some uh, groups that come to these live streams are talkative and some are not. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But please throw your questions in the, in the chat. I would love to deal with uh, questions about um, pr predictability, uh, productivity, and the desire for control. So uh, this is the framework that we'll use turned the correct direction. So uh, apologies. I'll try to debug my... Um, uh, technology here so that you can uh, think about it the right way. But uh, just think about it this way. I get myself turned this right. There we go. Uh, uh, on the upper right, we have, I hope you're seeing it the same way I am. On, on one side, we have uh, uh, productivity. On the other side, we have predictability. And then we have a desire for control that keeps pulling us down this direction. Now, I see this all the time at my clients. So uh, I have one that um, I think had uh, just instituted, I was just talking about them uh, earlier today with some of their investors, um, they had instituted three or four different complex steps between the time when somebody had an idea and when somebody could try it out with customers. And they said, isn't this wonderful? Now we're being very disciplined. We're really thoughtful. We really have these things defined well. Uh, aren't we doing a great job? I said, no, we're not doing a great job. Uh, we're avoiding the uh, potential benefits that we could get from taking a risk. And uh, wouldn't it be great if uh, we put something live, we released a feature, we uh, built a piece of software, and we showed it to other people, and they said they didn't like it. Wouldn't that be great? That was not their attitude. <laughs> their attitude was, we cannot fail. We cannot do something that will not work. That's the, uh, the, the death knell for us. But we're not going to allow that to happen. And, and I think that's just the, one of the most dangerous attitudes you can take. So I'm wondering, uh, are you guys uh, out there uh, taking an attitude like that? Are you seeing people in your organization who have um, a design sprint, a high-level design sprint, a, um, a low-level design sprint, a uh, definition sprint, uh, followed by actually building some code, and then a release sprint? Uh, if I counted that up right, and if it's the usual two weeks, uh, we're at something like two months now. Uh, and uh, it is not unusual for me to have clients who uh, bring me a, a process that looks something like that. It's really safe. It's down here, far down on the uh, predictability end. Produces a lot of predictable results. Not usually what tech teams are all about. Not what we're that. Not the way that we can get the most value out of a technology organization. So, um, uh, if you find yourself in that situation, if you find yourself in an environment where uh, the risk register is king, where the change committee um, has to meet before you can decide to do anything. Uh, if you find yourself in that kind of situation, uh, then this is for you because uh, we need to do something different. And the first thing you can say is, um, uh, we have an unhealthy desire for control. Do we really need this much control? Uh, and sometimes just asking that question will uh, change perceptions sufficiently. So um, my first piece of advice is start by questioning how much do you really need this? How much do we need this uh, uh, levels of approval, um, the uh, careful predicting of our roadmap, uh, very detailed estimation? Do we really need all that? Uh, my answer is usually no. So um, uh, then there's uh, the question that you're naturally going to ask, I think, and uh, ready for your questions in the chat whenever you'd like to share them. Um, 
the question I ha often get here is why on earth uh, are we uh, allowing this um, uh, process around us uh, to stop us from acting? Um, and uh, so that's one of the things that I'll talk about soon. What process could you individually use? What could you do so that you can be more uh, uh, risk friendly inside possibly an organization that's very risk averse? Uh, and I've done that quite a lot. So very happy to answer questions and comment on them. We have Ian uh, who has a long comment. So I'm just going to read it out rather than if I put it on the screen, I'll have to look over it. Um, no question, but in our organization, we have huge change approval boards. Many people need to approve production releases where most don't understand the change, but as long as Bob is okay with it, I'll approve too. Excellent, Ian, I've been there many times. Um, I really don't see the value that these additional approvals bring. Where is risk being reduced? I just see productivity being affected. Ian, I, 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 I promise I don't know Ian and I didn't pay Ian to, to ask this question, but I wish I had. And Ian, we should talk some more because um, there's lots we can do here. But um, the, uh, Ian is, is illustrating perfectly the kind of uh, risk averse, um, uh, low productivity uh, situation that many of my clients find themselves in. And um, uh, I'm just about to talk about, Ian, some, some suggestions for what you individually might do to change the attitudes and the actions. So we're going to deal first with the attitudes. How do we start to change the culture in the organization so you see these things differently? You may not succeed there, right? So your mileage may vary, but I want to talk about some ways that I've found that are successful in breaking up that habit um, and reducing the desire for control that unrealistically pulls you down the, the tilted slider. So that's one. Um, and, and then the next thing I'm going to talk about is let's suppose we aren't changing the attitudes. How can we uh, uh, adjust? How can we deal with uh, the uh, the risk situation in the environment we're in? What, what can we do to change it? So Ian, stay tuned. Uh, more coming. Uh, if anybody has to leave, this will always be here as a recording and you can find it on the Squirrel Squadron forum. So um, let me deal with Ian's question. Um, oh, and we've got uh, a few from Sanjeev as well, which is fantastic. Thank you, Sanjeev. I'll come back to those, but, but let me deal with um, uh, the, these uh, notions of, of changing attitudes. So um, the, the first one I want to talk about is something called coherence busting. And um, the, what often happens is that uh, other people will make assumptions which lead to fears. And those questions, those uh, assumptions are never questioned. So um, somebody says, well, this makes sense. It would make sense. And, and it would be coherent. It would be a rational explanation. I could understand it if we said, hey, look, uh, we, the regulators will never let us release a, a feature without a full security test. Right? Our regulator would come and kill us. We'd never get it out. Um, we'd be in trouble, um, in legal trouble. Legal would get um, all over us. I've been in situations where I was dealing with uh, a merchant bank who uh, had to check everything for us from Gibraltar. You can imagine that was not a very uh, speedy process. Um, and uh, uh, we had to phone, we had a big phone bill to Gibraltar phoning for every single change we, we wanted to make in, in what was essentially a bank for children. So uh, uh, I've been there, I've seen that. Um, and the, the challenge is that, that no one's ever thought about what the other options might be. Uh, and I'll, I'll deal with it briefly. I'll go into it more if people are interested. And it's it's uh, in Agile Conversations, my book with Jeffrey Frederick. Um, but the, the basic idea of coherence busting is that um, although people like coherent stories, they like a story like the regulator won't let us or um, uh, in Ian's situation, the change approval board won't go for it unless Bob goes for it. Uh, those are uh, kind of assumptions and beliefs which aren't questioned and which come very coherently. They make sense. Hey, it would make sense. If people on the change approval board all agreed and they kind of had it set up beforehand and they knew what they were going to approve, that, that would make sense. That's a coherent story, but there's not a lot of evidence for it. And that's where coherence busting can really help you to change your mindset and therefore approach the situation differently. So uh, the process of coherence busting uh, starts with coming up with a ridiculous, intentionally absurd explanation. The change control board is dedicated to uh, stopping us releasing. Uh, because uh, they're actually secretly in the employ of one of our competitors, and they're trying to sabotage our company. Now, this explanation is uh, pretty unlikely, right? That's probably, I'm using Ian's example, it's probably not what's happening to Ian. But uh, it is at least as well supported by the facts as some other beliefs that people on that change control board might have, or that you might have about them. So uh, if they believe the regulator won't let us, if they believe um, this doesn't match the strategy and we can't uh, alter the strategy, if they have those kinds of beliefs, you can um, suggest other beliefs which would also match the facts. 
And uh, you don't have to start with the ridiculous ones. That tends to get your brain juices going. But you could say things like, um, uh, we, we, we've gotten so used to um, following what the Change Control Board does and, and um, uh, uh, checking with everyone before we put anything live that we've uh, forgotten that other options might exist. And um, uh, another option, another possible explanation is um, uh, we're, we're, um, uh, 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 we've been... Uh, uh, Pressured by our investors into being conservative, and uh, we believe that the board won't uh, won't allow us to, to take certain kinds of risks. But we haven't actually asked the board. So the coherence busting process is start with a ridiculous explanation that would also match the facts. Come up with uh, uh, several more, uh, you know, three, four, five. What Jeffrey likes to say, my co-author, is if you can't think of five, think of twenty, uh, because that will be easier. And what you're trying to do is generate lots of explanations which could help you, and these are explanations for you, uh, uh, which could help you to approach the uh, situation differently and to think, well, gosh, um, maybe I don't have to have the change control board's approval. Maybe the board is more approachable than I thought. Maybe there's a board, a board of directors who could direct the change control board. There's lots of possibilities there. So if you can change your own mindset first, and uh, move yourself off the super predictable end of the tilted slider, then you will often see that um, your attitude will change and that will change others. So uh, that's one of my favorite techniques. I'm very happy to go more in depth on it and describe more how that works. But um, if you can start by breaking up the assumption that uh, things can't be different uh, and list maybe even ridiculous explanations for how they could be different, then you start to understand um, how risk could be helpful to you. Because instead of saying, this is a risk, it must be bad, you've, you've busted the coherent story. You've come up with a different alternative explanation. Okay, um, let me look at Sanjeev's questions here. Um, so uh, Sanjeev asks, uh, what about teams who factor in very little risk? Ah, and boy, this, um, I really have to learn how to do StreamYard better. I can't get my tilted slider up. And uh, Sanjeev's question, which is very helpful, is uh, appearing below me here. Now I've moved. Uh, that should work better. So um, uh, who factor in very little risk. So Sanjeev, I'm assuming that uh, you have kind of an opposite problem to Ian. In other words, you don't have a, a board who's stopping you taking risks. You have teams who assume that everything's going to go well. Uh, and, and this is definitely a different type of problem. So um, this is uh, uh, taking too much risk, probably, um, uh, not looking at uh, whether you're uh, uh, acting too, uh, too cavalierly, too, uh, uh, moving too, too, uh, in the direction that's too much productivity and, and not enough um, uh, care and caution and thoughtfulness. Not my main theme today, so I'm not going to go into it in very much depth, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm more focused on the other end of the tilted slider today. How can we use risk? Um, but uh, if your team's not including enough risk, um, uh, that, that's a, a less common problem, but still can be very concerning. Uh, I'd be interested in knowing what's the, uh, what, what's the challenge that the team sees. Do they see that uh, as a result of taking too much risk and, and, and not factoring in enough, not uh, providing enough mitigations, we're going to talk about those in a bit, um, or is it their challenge that they, that they just ignore that? Um, are they pressured? and therefore having to um, uh, take more risks than the company is comfortable with? Um, are they unaware of the risks that they're taking? Uh, that's a very common problem is someone says, oh, it'll be fine. You know, this is a well-known library. We can incorporate it into our software, no trouble. Then they discover that uh, you know, Log4j, which is used by pretty much everyone in all kinds of places they didn't realize, suddenly has a major security vulnerability. So Sanjeev, I'm not sure if I know exactly what the question is, but um, uh, I'd suggest that trying to understand what the cause is uh, what what is cause is it lack of knowledge is it uh, um, cavalierness um, not being worried about risk uh, is is it uh, misalignment to strategy uh, I think then the each of those will have different uh, steps to take but I think you'll it'll be clearer once you know why um, and Sanjeev has some more questions but I'm going to keep going with um, uh, impact and likelihood and mitigations but uh, I will come back to more questions and these are great by the way so uh, please ask more. Uh, very happy to to take questions at these sessions. They're they're much better when uh, you guys ask me good tough things. Um, so uh, I just want to mention a very standard thing in risk management. Probably most of you heard it before, but um, uh, there's there's one twist I want to add to it, um, just because the analysis is helpful. This could help Sanjeev in your situation where um, teams are are not analyzing their risk well, um, and that is the impact versus likelihood um, uh, uh, metric. Um, now sometimes that's presented more as a slider or as something that. Um, 
uh, kind of varies from low impact to, and low likelihood to high. But um, uh, the thing I want to think about is kind of one quadrant out of the four possibilities. You have high impact. In other words, the risk happens, something bad happens, and it hurts a lot of people. It causes a lot of loss. Um, the, the profits go down. Um, you know, what's the impact? And then what's the likelihood? Is this uh, an asteroid that might strike us? And um, you know, it has some probability, but pretty low. Or, or is it uh, the sun coming up? You know, we're, we're pretty positive the sun's going to come up. If that's a risk for us, if we don't like sun, uh, we might want to do something about that. Um, so the impact versus likelihood is a very standard way to analyze. But something I always see people leave out is how bad humans are at it. And there's a particular piece of it, which I just want to draw your attention to, because uh, it hits tech teams that I work with all the time. Uh, and that is something that is high impact and low likelihood. And the aforementioned asteroid is one example of that. Um, Log4j is another. Um, it wasn't very likely that a well-used library, well understood um, in, in lots and lots of pieces of software would have a security vulnerability. But guess what it did? And it had a big impact. So um, the problem is that humans do a terrible, terrible job of assessing things that are very unlikely, but that would be very bad. And uh, some examples from uh, ordinary life are things like people who are afraid of flying on airplanes. You know, we all know the statistics, airplanes are very safe. It's very, um, you know, you're more danger to drive your car than to um, fly across Europe. Um, all of those uh, things we've heard before and we know them well, doesn't stop people um, assessing the risk incorrectly, um, objectively, and being very frightened or refusing to get on airplanes. Um, we, we saw similar sorts of things with vaccines for COVID and you know, it became very prominent. And there, there were examples, very, very rare ones of people who were badly injured by blood clots and, and, and other things. Um, but most people were not damaged by this, right? This was not a, a, um, a high risk. Um, it was a very low risk of a very bad thing. Uh, and it was very hard for human beings to assess that. Um, so uh, one of the challenges is um, uh, when, when you see someone looking at a technology issue and they're saying, uh, gosh, if we went live with this, there's a chance that we could be down for a whole day. Well, yes, there's a chance that we could be, we could be hit by an asteroid as well. This usually doesn't work very well if you talk in these terms, right? So <laughs> if you compare the thing someone's afraid of to being hit by an asteroid, they don't take that well, quite understandably. But what can be helpful is to do some coherence busting and to break up this idea um, and, and understand their reasoning a bit more. Um, and even maybe to give them some of the experience or point to experience they have, um, which illustrates that the, the um, impact is lower and the likelihood is lower uh, than they might think. Uh, so uh, that uh, uh, could be uh, or, uh, something like um, pointing out that, well, actually, you know, we, we do have downtime pretty regularly, but users don't notice. It's because our monitoring systems find it quickly. So did you know that we were down for five minutes uh, last week? Often people aren't aware of this, so they don't know that the event they're worried about is already happening. Um, or they'd like to hear about some of the mitigations that you have in place, which we're just about to talk about. Or they'd like to, um, uh, they find it helpful uh, if you can do a test. So we're, we're going to put it live at midnight and, and we'll uh, turn it off again afterwards. But you know, we only have 1% of our users on at midnight. So uh, we're going to try that and see if the bad thing happens. So um, just like, uh, you know, when uh, my wife wanted to learn to be less afraid of needles, one of the things we did was bring some needles into the same room and then some needles closer to her. So she became less frightened um, irrationally. She knew it was irrational, but that didn't change it for her. But having the experience of uh, 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 seeing needles um, actually helped her. So she was able then to get blood tests um, much more successfully. So um, that's one example of uh, the sort of thing that you can do for someone is help them to experience the um, uh, the potential bad thing, the, uh, the outcome. Uh, so that they can see actually it's not as bad as they thought or that there are good mitigations in place. Okay, uh, so let me look at uh, Sanjeev's other question here, uh, making sure I cover these topics. Uh, if devs have, I'm not gonna put this on the screen because it would be too big. Uh, if devs have the freedom to build whatever they like, which I think should be supported, key for innovation. Totally agree, we've talked about that before. Shouldn't there be some form of validation before their ideas get into production? How would you frame that conversation? I see linked to Sanji's earlier question. So uh, absolutely agree. And that brings me perfectly on to the topic of mitigations. Um, so uh, uh, one of the, my favorite things to do with risks, once we've kind of changed our attitudes to them, once we've coherence busted, once we've looked at the likelihood and the impact, and we've said, oh, I think the low likelihood, high impact, we've got a lot of mitigations. We've got a lot of things that we can do to reduce uh, the impact of this risk, not to make it not happen, but to reduce its impact. 
Um, and uh, certainly uh, some form of validation before your ideas get to production is a mitigation. Uh, and phrasing it in those terms, I find, usually can be very, very helpful. Uh, so let me illustrate a couple of those. Um, so uh, and, and then point out uh, how you know when to introduce these and where. Um, I call this armor plating, but armor plating in the right places. You, know, you don't need to put armor plating on the soles of your feet generally, but armor plating right here around the critical areas, uh, that seems like a good idea. So we'll talk about how to do that. Um, so uh, three different areas I thought of, I'm sure you could think of some more, um, are uh, automated testing. So uh, developers, um, if anybody doesn't know this, developers can write code so that uh, computers will check uh, that the, the software does what it's supposed to do. This is the sort of validation that Sanjeev's talking about. So um, I would be a, a, a huge fan of, uh, of that kind of validation, that kind of mitigation to reduce the impact of, say, a software change, because we, we've put in place tests that computers will run very reliably. They'll do the same thing every time, and they will tell us this piece of software is doing what it's supposed to do. Um, here's another one. Um, get yourself some centaurs. Yes, I, I said centaurs, C-E-N-T-A-U-R-S. Uh, you might remember these are uh, the Greek, I think it was Greek, um, uh, mythological creatures who are half horse and half human. Um, so uh, centaurs are a great way to uh, reduce your risk, uh, to mitigate it. What, what on earth do I mean? Uh, this is a term from chess, actually, um, but I wish people were using it more often. Um, uh, it's uh, uh, when you get a computer, computers are better than humans at chess these days, but in certain situations, right? So they're, they're good at kind of crunching the, the situation, understanding, it, and they can beat humans most of the time, but humans are still more creative. Humans have um, uh, ideas that computers don't have. And so the idea um, of a, you can have a chess match between centaurs, a centaur is a hu human plus a computer. So the computer is su suggesting ideas, um, giving the, the human analyses that the human couldn't do fast enough. And the human is supplying creative ideas. So uh, if you can get a human into the loop somewhere, if you can get a human involved in the process, uh, of um, re releasing your software, of uh, sending an email. Uh, if it's an automated one, maybe a human could check a sample of the emails before your uh, machine sends out hundreds of thousands of wrong emails. Um, and a human would be very good at checking that, um, but a computer would be very good at actually performing the action. Um, uh, this is uh, particularly useful in the area of artificial intelligence. Um, so I have a client right now who um, uh, are uh, they're, they're dealing with image recognition. So they want to check that um, uh, images are the correct images or the incorrect images are filtered out. Um, and this is a, a hard problem, both for humans and computers. But a human plus a computer is a better combination than either. So a computer will recognize, well, there's kind of a pink thing in the middle of the screen, and um, it's it's uh, sort of uh, shaped like a person, but I'm not sure exactly what it is. And you show it to a per to the computer to a human, and the human says, oh, that's a hand. That's squirrel holding up his hand. That's what that is. So we would recognize that as a picture of a hand. They have this kind of uh, processing in place. Actually, I have a couple clients who do this kind of thing, where you have a centaur, a, a human, working with a computer that actually does the mitigation that, that checks that the uh, uh, the software is doing the right thing. And you do that in production with, with live data. Um, the last area I thought of, just as I was scribbling these down before, um, is uh, any form of loose coupling. So uh, there's a whole uh, uh, wonderful book um, that uh, I'd heartily recommend called Normal Accidents um, and, and a, a follow-up. Um, was, uh, the guy's name is Chris Clearfield. Uh, I can't remember um, uh, what his uh, what his book is following on from uh, uh, Perro's uh, Normal Accidents. But um, all of these are about um, uh, um, how bad things happen. What what is it that causes um, bad things to occur? Uh, crashes of ships, um, uh, uh, spacecraft that bang into each other, um, uh, uh, nuclear plants that melt down. Uh, so these are studies of these kinds of um, uh, uh, situations. And software, of course, is uh, one of the worst offenders here, right? We can create very catastrophic situations very, very quickly, usually because we tightly couple them. Uh, and there's a whole analysis in the book of uh, tight coupling and loose coupling and, and uh, how you get there. But um, my favorite example of this is the uh, flash crash. So this is when um, uh, there was a piece of software that went rogue and it literally sold um, uh, as much uh, st shares of stock that a hedge fund had as it possibly could and ran them hugely into the red. They had to be rescued and so on um, uh, in about an hour. And it was simply because uh, they had no humans in the loop. There was no mitigation uh, and they had no control over this piece of software. It was tightly coupled to other pieces of software. They didn't understand what it was doing and they couldn't stop it. 
Um, so this is kind of the worst example. So the complete opposite direction of um, uh, 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 from the kind of mitigations we've just been talking about. The mitigation you would take is to loosely couple your systems. So for example, if they had had a setup so that there was a, a piece of software that was um, saying it would be a good idea to sell this sh these shares of stock, and it was separated from another piece of software that said, let's buy or sell whatever the shares are. Uh, they would have been much better shape because this one might have gone rogue, but this one could be controlled. Um, and, and so because there was a loose coupling between them, they could break the coupling. Uh, in fact, what they had was in order to trade as fast as they could, they had the system that was making the decisions tied up directly to the exchange. So uh, they would make all the trades instantly. This is very bad in normal situations um, and uh, is, is a way of uh, creating uh, an increased risk where you typically don't need it. So um, uh, there are just three uh, examples of mitigations. These are the armor plating that you can put uh, around your system to reassure people and to reassure yourself that the risk is mitigated and that would allow you then to, um, to move faster. Um, now, how do you know where to put these? And, and this is my, my favorite piece um, here. If you take away no other piece of advice, use this one because uh, it stood me in good stead for many, many years. That is um, put this armor plating where the software tells you to. What does squirrel mean? What, how, how would you know where the, the armor plating should go? What, how does the software tell you? It tells you by having problems. So uh, for example, uh, I had a, a piece of software that was worst spaghetti you've ever seen. I had inherited it. It, was, it, was, it did its job that, man, you touched it any place and everything would break. And we got very used to that um, in, in my team. And, and we, we weren't able to fix it all at once. But what we did have was we had regular requests for changes and updates in places where the software didn't do what it was supposed to do or where the, the needs had changed. And so our uh, approach was very simple. We put in place these kinds of mitigations and improvements and refactorings and improvements and um, rewritings and changes. Uh, and we did this only where we had requests, only where we had problems. So the about page on our website, which kind of told the story of our founders, you know what? We never changed that because no one ever asked to make a change there. The story hadn't changed. There wasn't any update there. It wasn't getting a lot of use. It wasn't a place we needed armor plating. But the place we really needed it was uh, the login page, the transact page where people would actually pay us, um, the uh, uh, popular sales pages. This was an e-commerce uh, uh, company. Um, so the uh, sales of shoes and handbags and so on, those were the places that had the high traffic, that had the problems, that had the bugs that were causing us to sell items for 1% uh, of their proper price and so on. And when we'd get those, that's when we'd add the armor plating. That's when we added tests. That's when we added humans into the loop. That's when we got systems to be loosely coupled. So um, that, that's my advice on mitigating the risk. Um, look for methods. I've given you three. There are plenty more. Um, and uh, look for ways to make sure your systems are loosely coupled, not tightly coupled. And lots more about that. I will throw it in the comment. I can put it in. Uh, that'll show up on LinkedIn, I think. Um, uh, and uh, uh, maybe Laura can share it elsewhere. Uh, the book is called Normal Accidents. And it's by a, a chap named Pero. Uh, so um, if you're if you're interested, uh, that's a great read. Uh, you want to read it kind of in a safe place, <laughs> maybe not on an airplane in a thunderstorm, um, because it'll it'll uh, curl your hair and, and terrify you all the different bad things that can happen. On the other hand, it's very very helpful for understanding how software might uh, uh, um, uh, uh, in, encounter different types of catastrophes. Excellent. So that's all my prepared material. So uh, I'm looking, thanks very much, Laura. Uh, looking for, for more questions. I'm going to give, uh, you know, uh, 10 or 20 seconds while I'm uh, saying a bit more about Squirrel Squadron. Um, please ask a question if you have one. Um, uh, we've had some great ones from uh, Sanjeev and Ian. Really glad that you uh, were here. Thank you very much for coming. Um, and uh, if you're interested in more discussions like this, uh, we've got lots more on the Squirrel Squadron. So um, we hold these events every week. Uh, sometimes they're uh, closed Zoom. Uh, sometimes they're open live streams like this, uh, but they're all for members of the Squirrel Squadron. So um, you can go to squirrelsquadron.com. Uh, so I'll throw that in the in the chat and let Laura copy elsewhere. Uh, Squirrel Squadron, and I'll get it on the screen as well, uh, is the place where you can find um, uh, more events like this. We're discussing fear next week. Uh, we have um, uh, co uh, engineering culture as the next live stream in two weeks. Uh, we have a live event in London on the 7th on um, uh, uh, tech baloney. Uh, when are people lying to you and fooling you about tech? Uh, those are the sorts of things that uh, we're discussing all the time. And we have the forum as well, uh, where I'm ready to answer questions and comments. Uh, so uh, I think not seeing any more questions, I'm going to close there and uh, wish you a very risky and uh, happy Thursday. 
and uh, would love some more questions after this. Uh, if you're watching the recording, if you're interested, head on over to the forum, uh, ask some questions about risk. Uh, I, one of my favorite topics, and I'd be happy to discuss it more with you. Everybody have a fantastic Thursday. Take care.